Hi everyone, welcome uh, to another interview with Option 3. Um, today I'll be interviewing Marcy Wheeler. Marcy Wheeler, who also goes by the web handle Empty Wheel, is a blogger who focuses on civil liberties and national security issues. She is known for her reporting on US versus Libby, her blog at EmptyWheel.net, and her book Anatomy of Deceit, which addresses the outing of Valerie Plain Wilson and the Bush administration's justification for the Iraq War. She has a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Michigan, my own, my own alma mater, where she focused on, among other things, the Flueton, which I might be mispronouncing, which is the 19th century version of a blog, which is kind of cool. In my research of the NSA, I have found her work to be the most consistently detailed reporting on the subject. In a Newsweek piece from October, Barton Gelman of the Washington Post said the following of her. She's indispensable now with the NSA story, which is endlessly complex. I can't agree more. I hope you enjoy. So, you know, the nature of your writing is very, very precise. And you cover, like, real specific issues, you know, as they, as they arise and as you read them. And I read the news, Newsweek article about you, and, the, you know, the, and it's evident in your work how thorough you are. But there's one thing I don't see a lot of times, and that's a big picture. Sometimes I do, but a big picture view of what's going on right now in the NSA process. And I'm just wondering if you wanted to share that big picture view. Because we have Snowden, because we have um, actual documents from the NSA, we're seeing what the NSA does. What we're not seeing is how that ties into what the FBI does and what the National Counterterrorism Center and to a lesser degree the CIA does. And it's important to remember that because um, what the NSA does affects a great deal of Americans, uh, predominantly Muslims. We, you know, we have to assume, given the way that they're "quote unquote" targeting this. Um, but I, but I think it's not unfair to assume that many of the country's Muslims are three degrees of separation from somebody who might be considered, uh, you know, an associate of terrorism, um, even if it's just through their mosque, right? So, um, so that affects a great deal of Americans, but the way you see the effect of what the NSA does and the kind of um, guilt by association that the NSA does is go going to be in the FBI infiltrating mosques or setting up stings of young men and over the course of two years finally getting them to agree to press a button and therefore go to jail for 20 years. Um, we see it in people not being allowed to fly anymore. The no-fly lists ultimately come back to intelligence that probably comes from NSA. We don't see how any of that happens because we, we haven't had an Edward Snowden from the FBI. We haven't had an Edward Snowden from the National Counterterrorism Center. And so those, those areas are completely opaque to us or largely opaque to us. Um, except from the other side where we're seeing, you know, the way prosecutions happen and the way that people who shouldn't be on the no-fly list are on the no-fly list. The phone dragnet is ostensibly tied solely to counterterrorism in Iran. It's not tied to counterintelligence or hackers. And a great deal of what the NSA does with other authorities, with the 702, for example, actually is tied to hackers. And that's an area where we're going to see it affect Americans more directly as well. Um, but it's it's an area where we're not uh, the 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 government very deliberately has been saying terror terror you know up until June fifth of last year they were saying cyber 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 and then on June fifth they started saying terror 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 again after having not done so for years and there, that was a very deliberate strategy um, to distract from the practices that actually are more intrusive on your average. Christian or Jewish, uh, non-Arab, non-South Asian American. And so I think that, that, you know, that's a discussion we haven't had either. So, um, you know, partly I, what I'm trying to say is as, as frightened as people might be or might not be about the NSA disclosure so far, that's really just a part of the bigger picture of the surveillance state. And we need to remember that. Both the review group um, to a lesser degree, P Club and the Leahy Sensenbrenner USA Freedom Act um, 
hit at national security letters, hit at, so hit at the FBI's authority to, with no judicial process, go and get, um, get lots of information. And potentially, I mean, they've hinted, both, both the review group and Congress have hinted that the FBI gets this information in some kind of bulk. And um, so we're being told there's a, there's a troubling FBI side, but, that, but we're not even hearing, hearing about that. So what happens going forward? I, you know, I, that's why we play the game. But um, I think there are many potential hap- uh, approaches. One is that um, I do think the House is quite serious about changing this, partly because it's a more politicized body and partly because for some reason, and I've got, you know, several different theories, but for some reason Republicans feel like they can hurt Obama with this um, and so they've got an incentive in a way that the Senate doesn't. Right. Um, but, you know, I think it is very likely this isn't going to come to a head until the Patriot Act comes up for reauthorization next year. So 2015 in June. You're going to see Diane Feinstein and others try and do with cybersecurity legislation what she tried to do with her fake vice um, by by kind of sneaking these authorities in there. It's something the 9-11 committee recommended and first was put through as a sort of whitewash that had no effect and then in 2007 was given a little bit of oomph um, but was never functional until literally weeks before the Snowden leak started happening. Never, you know, it, it was never flushed out, it never had staff. Um, and they also, they came out with a report a week and a half ago which was, um, had a different focus than the review, than the Obama review group. and. Uh, and I think they have, frankly, I think they have a better understanding of these programs than the review group actually did. P Club is worth following because originally they were going to do a report on both the phone dragnet and 702, which some people think of as PRISM, but it's PRISM plus upstream collection, um, which, you know, so the. That they were going to do a report on the two main authorities that everyone has been talking about, and their report that came out about ten days ago only addressed the the phone dragnet, um, mm-hmm. and it was a hundred two hundred and thirty pages, and it only addressed the phone dragnet. So th- they're still working on one that will address Section seven hundred two of FISA, which is the the kind of bulk content collection. Um, I suspect they're going to get around to talking about uh, what's called EO twelve three thirty three. Yeah. which is where all the other spying goes on and they have they have to my mind one of the one of the most sophisticated understandings of w- where those battle lines are drawn and the importance of understanding those battle lines so they they're still working mm-hmm. and um they have for a variety of reasons more independence than the review group did so um we'll see what kind of news they make in the days ahead where I got started in, in the idea of interviewing people is because I just wanted to sort of get some sanity check on some subjects. And one of the big ones I think about is the is a committee-level investigation uh, in, this, in the Senate and the House. And uh, you told me to read this book, um, Challenging the Secret Government, and I did. And I found it um, disheartening more than anything else. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> and um, so where do you think we are in terms of Getting a, do we need an investigation? The other question: Do we need do we need an investigation, and are we even in a society anymore that can to, can really do an investigation? Congress has the advantage of a, a different legal position than P Club. Um, one of the recommendations, actually, that both review group that that the review review group made was the P Club should be much stronger. They should have stronger subpoena power. Without that, they're going to, um, particularly after their report, uh, they're going to begin to get stonewalled on key issues. As it was, we know that the government was stalling on giving them information about 12333 activities. So um, th- I think P Club could be a very interesting group, although the Republicans on it were kind of deliberately picked to protect the, the Bush programs. They both were involved in it. They both were in DOJ uh, while those were developed. Um, whereas Congress, for all its warts, Congress has the ability and interest to make political stink. And um, to the extent that 
that's useful or available, then you, you sort of unfortunately have to look to Congress to do it. Where we're at, which is, you know, um, in the 70s, everything got blamed on Nixon, which was unfair to Nixon because LBJ was just in, as involved in all of it, and LBJ might have been even closer to Hoover. But, uh, but uh, um, it, because it got blamed on Nixon, it was easier for Democrats, it was easier to turn it into a political thing. At this point, both Obama and Bush own these programs. And so it takes a particular kind of politician to want to press the issue. When the FISA court was was established, um, the con what Congress it was very clear, and it was written down and admitted that it was very clear that Congress and the executive branch did not agree about <coughs> how much authority FISA had. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, underlying FISA is the question of whether or not the executive executive branch has unfettered authority to conduct wiretapping um, in the name of national security. No one has ever, you know, uh, the Supreme Court has said domestically the executive branch doesn't have that. Um, but I think this Supreme Court would approve so much that the executive branch has already done. I mean, and this is why the metadata question is so important, that, um, that even that decision, which says the executive can't wiretap, on, you know, without limits domestically, even that, I think, I'm not sure that the Supreme Court would, would decide the case in the same way. And so w the problem with both Congress and FISA is that they, they don't trust their own power. They don't, they, FISA has been able to leverage the executive branch, as far as I understand, in two ways. One is to prohibit certain kinds of information from coming before FISA. So, and they did this both with Bush's illegal program and they've done it um, more recently. They've basically said, you know, if we get information that is either illegal content collection from the United States, um, either via upstream collection, I mean, the way they got the internet metadata was upstream collection in all intents and purposes. So, you know, they say, if, if we get this information, then we're going to, then, then you're in legal violation of a law and we're going to refer you for it. Um, and and then again that they they would or they would say you know you need to make sure we don't receive any information that none of the um, really that none of the warrant information that you give us for FISA includes any of this intelligence that we consider ill-gotten. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one leverage, and the other leverage is again there are a few um, a few laws that John Bates in particular said the government was was in violation of. Right. And that's it. That's the, all the leverage FISA has. Right. And if the United States, as they can, if NSA, as they can, can technically just go overseas and do the same kind of wiretapping, and I, and I think, you know, I, I, I'm very lonely in this opinion, but I believe that's what they did with the Internet metadata. Rather than collecting it domestically where there were limits on, on how much metadata they could collect, they just went overseas, collected it there. There were no limits on First Amendment. There were no limits on, or there were fewer limits on dissemination. And there was no pesky FISA court reviewing it um, saying you've, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. So you're, and, saying, and actually, so you're saying the collected data surveilled Americans? From overseas, is that what you're saying? Basically, it's like performing. Yeah, I mean, there's a long history of that in any case, right. but I'm but I'm also saying that they, I I believe there is reason to believe that the function that used to be accomplished by the Internet Metadata Program here domestically can be and is to a large extent accomplished by collection overseas, mm -hmm. and you know, overseas has to be. Scare quoted that way because, um, you know, we know, for example, that they're breaking into Google cable overseas. They should be able to get all of that data via FISA domestically, but they're choosing to do it overseas, which raises questions. Um, we know that if GCHQ collects something, then they can share it with us and it counts as overseas collection. But the, but the, but the point is that the way the Internet, especially Internet content works in this day and age, there's no, I mean, the notion of national boundaries is largely 
outdated. And given that that's true, and given that it's that that the NSA can operate with so fewer restrictions overseas, then they really have a big incentive to take all their toys and go overseas any time the FISA court um, tries to limit what they're doing. And, and there's fewer and fewer functions. I mean, the phone metadata is one function that probably still needs to have some tie here because there's there's some there's some collection you're not going to get except in the United States, but. You know, to a large extent, they can bring the rest of it overseas, and and because the internet doesn't know national boundaries, they can collect overseas and then operate with less, with less, um, w- with fewer limits. And then, similarly, I mean, the, the same thing happened with Congress when when um, when the New York Times busted Bush's illegal wiretap program. Um, Diane Feinstein was fur- actually furious. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the NSA's biggest champion now was furious, and she was furious for one reason above all, which is that um, to do Bush's illegal program, um, Bush's lawyers basically said that uh, FISA has what's called an exclusivity pr- provision. It basically says that FISA is the exclusive means by which the 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 U.S. government c- uh, conducts electronic surveillance in the United States. So. Exclusive means, um, and they basically blew off exclusive means that provision, both by declaring certain things no longer electronic surveillance, and by saying we can't be bound by that language because we're the commander in chief. Mm-hmm. And so Diane Feinstein, during the passage of, of FISA Amendments Act, that's all she cared about was that we get back to exclusive means. You know, she wanted to ensure that domestic collection was going to be conducted under some kind of rubric of law and court and what have you. And the process I've just described to you where, you know, when the executive branch gets caught doing things they shouldn't be domestically and they have the technical ability to go overseas, um, we know, I mean, one of one of my favorite moments in this entire Snowden leak scenario is when the Washington Post first came out with a 12-333 story and uh, and Bart Gelman got Diane Feinstein on the record going, uh, we don't really even know what they're doing under 12-333. Meaning that if the NSA takes their toys and goes overseas and collects the same information overseas and that's their means of getting by the exclusivity pr- provision, which was the only thing Diane Feinstein wanted, then she's lost all her power. She's lost all her leverage over what the NSA does, um, mm-hmm. and which is what she cared about. And quite frankly, when they were passing, when they were the very beginning discussions of the FISA Amendments Act in 2008, uh, the discussion went back to 2007, they were quite honest. People, including Keith Alexander, were like, well, you know, we can't abrogate the, the executive's power, so we can't tell you that we're not going to do this in other means. And, and Russ Feingold said then, and I think it was various, you know, as, as always, Russ Feingold, I think, knew exactly what was going down in 2008. He said, look, you know, you're telling me if you don't like what we do with this law, you're just going to take your toys and go overseas. I mean, he didn't say that. That's my phrase. But he basically, you know, he said, if you don't like what we're doing, you're just going to do it under 12.333 anyway. And they, they basically said yes. Yeah, and and so that's what we're seeing in the courts and in Congress right now. We're seeing this tremendous insecurity because they have no leverage over NSA. They have no way to stop what NSA is doing, and they're trying to remain relevant. You're talking about Congress. I'm talking about Congress and the FISA court. And the FISA court. 